Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new episode of Tech with Neela. So in today's session, we're going to talk about uh, best practices of using SageMaker model monitoring. Now, the prerequisite of this is you need to have at least level 200 level knowledge of model monitor, SageMaker model monitor. And this is a little bit advanced session for those who are already aware of the model monitor. But if you feel that you need to have a level 200 session or just a basic overview of what SageMaker model monitor is and maybe do a demo, et cetera, please comment on my video. Thank you. So let's get started. Now, SageMaker model monitor provides the following types of monitoring. So it'll help you to monitor drift in the data quality, drift in the model quality matrix, such as accuracy, and monitor the bias in your model prediction or monitor drift in the feature attribution. Now, if you take a look at the SageMaker model monitor, and if you go through the documentation, there's a mention of SageMaker Clarify in conjunction with model monitor. And you'll be thinking, what, what is happening here? So let's, let's talk a little bit more about it, right? So SageMaker Clarify is essentially a container that produces the bias and explanatory report. And SageMaker Monitor is actually a service which performs these recurring monitoring on the models and the data which is captured from the endpoint or the batch transform job. Now, the two out of the four, as shown in this, in this picture here, right, requires the help of SageMaker Clarify container. So, in conclusion, you can use SageMaker Clarify independent to do a one-off job, but you can also use it in conjunction with SageMaker Model Monitor to run those recurring Clarify jobs. Now, in terms of the working process of Model Monitor, we can categorize the Model Monitoring out of the four into two, two different types, right? One that needs ground truth and one that doesn't need the ground truth. When I talk about ground truth, I'm not talking about the ground truth service that AWS offers, but I'm talking more in terms of the actual true labels, which are recorded from the business decision that was taken. Now, both data quality drift and feature attribution drift don't really need the ground truth label. The monitoring job is scheduled on an interval defined during the scheduling setup. And the schedule wakes the model monitor to check for drift. So the process summary is as follows. So step number one is you would create a baseline from the data set that was used to train the model. Now the baseline would compute the matrix and the suggested constraint for the matrix. Step number two is you would schedule a monitoring job which captures the data in production and computes the production matrix. And step number three is you would use the model monitor but the way it would do, what it would do in the background. So th what it would do is it will compare the matrix and send the results or violation report to S3 or CloudWatch. Now, if you look at the other two types, which requires the ground truth, right? It is very similar, right? The only difference is that both model quality drift and the bias drift requires the ground truth in order to compute the final matrix. Now, here is an additional step as well, right? You will need to set up another ETL process to bring all the ground truth label to S3, adhering to a specific format, as I've highlighted here in this picture. And the process follows the same flow. So you would first create a baseline from the data set that was used to train the model. Then you would merge the data captured from the production endpoint with the ground truth label. And then the model monitor will actually compare the matrix and push the result or the violation report to S3 or CloudWatch. Now, in terms of the way it is accessed, there are different mechanisms. Let's talk about it in terms of the persona. So AWS Python SDK and CLI and SageMaker pipelines are preferred method for machine learning engineers or data scientists, whereas business or data analysts prefers to use the SageMaker UI. 
Now, there are some limitations while using UI. For example, if you want to delete the interface endpoint hosted in SageMaker, which already has the model monitor enabled, you will have to first delete the model monitoring schedule via CLI or API. And you can't do it on, in, on the console. So I know it kind of gets a little bit tricky and you would get an error as shown in this particular slide. So you would have to either use CLI or API to delete it. And then from the UI or through API or CLI, you can delete it. I know it's kind of hard, but it is the way it is right now. Now, the model monitor computes model matrix and statistics on tabular data only. For example, if you have an image classification model, right, that takes image, it's not tabular data, but it's an image as an input and output is a label based on that image that needs, you can still use model monitor here, but the, the key thing to keep in mind is the model monitor will calculate matrix and statistic for the output and not really the input. Model monitor currently supports only endpoints that host a single model and does not support monitoring multi-model endpoints, not yet, right? It also supports batch transform. So if you have a sequence of different inference endpoints, right, leveraging the inference pipeline, like a single endpoint, but different models in the background, you can still use model monitor, but the way it would do it, it would capture and analyze data for the entire pipeline, and you will not really for the individual containers in the pipeline. And if you launch SageMaker Studio in a custom Amazon VPC, you will need to create a VPC endpoint to enable model monitor to communicate with Amazon S3 and CloudWatch. Now, in terms of the data capture, the first thing that you have to keep in mind is the AWS region. So you want to make sure that the S3 data capture should be in the same region as the model monitor schedule. And you want to keep an eye on the inference instance, right? You want to make sure that the disk utilization is below 75%. The reason is to prevent the impact to the inference request, the data capture stops capturing requests at a high level of disk utilization. And that's why it is recommended that you keep your disk utilization below 75% in order to ensure data capture continues capturing request. And then if you want that real-time monitoring effect, the way you can do it is you want to generate ground truth label quickly, and you can leverage Amazon's augmented A to I service to add the human in the loop capability who will generate the, the ground truth label, and hence you'll achieve the real-time monitoring effect. Now you can customize uh, some part of it, right? Some part of the model monitor and you can leverage the pre-processing and post-processing. These are plain Python script to transform the input to your model monitor or extend the code after a successful monitoring run. You can upload this file to S3 and reference them by create when you're creating your model monitor. And this can be using the create underscore monitoring underscore schedule method. Note that it is, it will only work with data and model quality jobs. So pre-processing can be used for, for example, data transformation as, as shown in this particular slide. Suppose the output of your model is an array, but the SageMaker model monitor container really requires tabular or flattened JSON structure. So you can use the pre-processing script to transform the array into the correct JSON structure. You can also use it for feature exclusion. So suppose your model has an optional feature and you use minus one to denote the optional feature has a missing value. If you have a data quality monitor, you may want to remove that so that it's not included and doesn't raise any kind of violation, right? And you can use the pre-processing script to do just that. You can remove those values to so exclude certain features. You can also use it to apply a custom sampling strategy in your pre-processing script. For example, in this use case, it is 10%. If your pre-processing script returns an error, you can check the exception message log to CloudWatch to debug. But in the pre-processing script, you can also add additional logging in. And then for the post-processing script, I don't really have an example, but the way I would want you to think about is, 
it is when you want to extend the code following a monitoring run. So you want to call a business application API or trigger an ETL process or anything that needs to succeed once the monitoring job is completed. Now let's take let's take a look at the baseline, right? So after you have configured your application to capture data during inference, the first step to monitor data and model quality or bias or explainability is create baseline. So all the four step has this process in it, right? Now let's take a look at some of the requirements and best practices for different baseline. So if you're using it for data quality, the data quality baseline, let's take a look at that first scenario. The schema of the training data set baseline data set and inference data set should be the same, both the number and the order of the feature. The first column should refer to the prediction or output. An important point to note here for avoiding error is to ensure that the column names for the baseline data set has only lower case letters and underscore as the only separator. Now, this is to maintain the maximum compatibility between SPA, CSV, JSON, and Parquet. Special characters can cause issues too, so be careful there as well. Now, in model quality monitoring, the predictions are compared to the ground truth label. Hence, a model quality baseline needs access to a data set that contains the ground truth label and prediction from the model being monitored. Now, for feature attribution drift, the way it is measured is by using the kernel snap algorithm. One needs to make a trade-off between the time taken and the complexity of the surrogate model by using the number of samples parameter. Above all, the main thing is to provide a good baseline for your use case, typically training data, validation data, or a golden batch data. Okay, now let's take a look at the bias drift baseline, right? You can specify it when you specify the configuration bias config and you have the label value or threshold to indicate the positive outcome, the facet name to specify the sensitive attribute column or the feature column, and the facet value or threshold to specify the value in that particular attribute. Now let's take Take a look at the second example here, right? So the facet theme is petal, petal length, the petal length of the flower, and the facet threshold that you have is set to five. Now the suggest underscore baseline method of the model monitor or model quality monitor classes triggers a processing job that computes the matrix and constraint for the baseline. Now, the result of the baseline job are two files, like we mentioned in the previous slide, statistic.json and constraint.json. Now, you can review the generated constraint and modify them before using them for monitoring. Based on your understanding of the domain and the business problem, you can actually make constraint more aggressive or relax it to control the number and the nature of the violation. Or, like in the given example, you can add a field to define a string constraint based on the understanding of your data. As a best practice, always review the baseline constraint generated by model monitor and adapt it as per your use case. Now to schedule monitoring for real-time endpoints, you would use the create underscore monitoring underscore schedule method of the respective model monitor class. Now when the ground truth is required for monitoring jobs like model quality, you will need to ensure that a monitoring job only uses data for which the ground truth is available. You can also want to keep an eye on the start time offset and end time offset to select the data that you want to use. So in take an example of the first use, first example here, right? If your ground truth comes in three days after the prediction has been made, you would want to set the start time offset to P3D and end time offset to minus P1D which is three days and one day respectively. Now, if your ground truth arrives six hours after the prediction and you have an hourly schedule, then you would use the six hours and one hour in that offset. Now, you can schedule model monitoring job for both a real-time endpoint and a batch transform like we talked in the previous slide. 
You also have an option to run these job on demand. Doesn't have to be scheduled all the time. And the way you can do it is by leveraging SageMaker Pipeline, which is a fully managed ML ops service that SageMaker offers is completely free of charge to use, but the under, you will only end up paying for the underlying compute. So it's serverless in that manner. And the way you can do that, set up your on-demand monitoring job is by leveraging the these two methods. So check check job config, and then you would specify the quality check config. And then for the clarify one, for checking the bias and explainability, you can leverage the clarify check config. Now SageMaker do offer a lot of pre-built algorithms and containers. But if you have a use case wherein you have to have to bring your own container, then that should not stop you from leveraging Model Monitor. SageMaker Model Monitor do provide a pre-built container with the ability to analyze the data captured from endpoint or batch transform job for tabular data set. But if you're bringing in your own container, you would it provides you extension points, which you can leverage. Basically, you have to adhere to the contract input and contract output to leverage the model monitor. The container can analyze the data in the data set underscore source path and write the report to the path in the output underscore path. The container code can write any report that suits your need. If you use the following structure and contract, certain output files are treated specifically by SageMaker in the visualization and API. Some scenarios where this can be useful is when you want to design monitoring for computer vision or natural language use cases or design any kind of custom matrix, you can go ahead and leverage this mechanism. Now you have all this data and you, you know, you're getting alerted as well, but what do you, the data is good only when you do take it, take that data to do certain action. And if you automate the action, then that's the, the most beautiful part about it, right? So having a effective deployment, you know, and model monitoring phase is important, right? And you want to continuously keep an eye on what's really happening. Uh, in this example, it's just one of the sample architecture and I will link the blog post in the description of this particular video. What it does is it will detect a drift in data drift for the model which was deployed, right? With respect to what was the training baseline. And once that drift is detected and the matrix exceeds the model specific threshold, then a CloudWatch alarm is triggered and an event bridge rule will start the model build pipeline. That means it will trigger the retraining. And hence, in this way, you can have the model retraining be automated based on the violation raised by the model monitoring. So that's it from my side. I mean, the idea here is for us to leverage the best practices while you're using SageMaker Model Monitor. It's really a powerful tool and it's fully managed. So, you know, go ahead and use it and let me know what you think.